Hi. This video is um, about serous membranes. Um, these are uh, membranes that coat the body cavities and the organs within the ventral body cavities. <clears throat> um, serous, uh, th these are lubricating membranes. Um, serous means watery. They're also sometimes called serosa, um, serous membranes or serosa. <clears throat> what it is, is um, a thin, think, um, kind of like a sheet of saran wrap that's coating the surface of all of the organs in your ventral body cavity. You can kind of see them here. They're represented in this dark aqua color. I'll show them to you in a little bit more detail in just a second. Um, they, um, you don't have serous membranes per se in the dorsal body cavities or the posterior aspect because there's a really complex series of membranes called meninges that wrap around the brain and the spinal cord. We'll cover those later this semester. <clears throat> but for right now, I want to kind of talk to you guys about serous membranes that wrap in the, um, in the ventral body cavity. So first off, remember that the ventral body cavity, we learned this in the last um, lecture, the ventral body cavity has um, some subdivisions. The diaphragm divides the ventral body cavity into the thoracic cavity and the abdominopelvic cavity. Um, and then there's further subdivisions in each, the thoracic and the abdominopelvic cavity. <clears throat> these body cavities are going to be lined with serous membranes. And the serous membranes are really kind of these double walled membranes. Let me show you one um, a little more closely. Let's blow this one up a little bit so that you can see this pericardium. Okay, so if I blow up the pericardium, um, the pericardial cavity, so notice what I'm doing. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take a single sheet of serous membrane and I'm going to wrap it around the organ touching the surface of the organ. It's drawn in aqua. I'm redrawing it in red here. Okay, so that if you opened up the cavity, the heart would look shiny because what you're actually seeing is this shiny membrane on the surface of the heart. And then it folds around and there's a space between the two layers. Talk about that in just a second. And so it's this double layered membrane. Um, the double layered membrane has um, a couple of names for each part. So let's talk about those. So the um, double layered membrane is going to have, let's see, it is going to have um, a portion that is actually touching or stuck to the wall of the organ itself. And you can see that right there. That portion right there is going to be called um, the visceral portion of the membrane, V-I-S-C-E-R-A-L. Visceral, like viscera, like guts, okay? That is the visceral portion of the serous membrane. And then there's gonna be another portion that's not touching the organ, but that is either touching or forming the body wall. So let's look at that one. So that portion is right here. Okay, not touching the organ. It's double layered. And that portion is not called visceral, it's called parietal. Okay, visceral and parietal. So the names for those two, the visceral and parietal, are all actually referring to the same sheet. Um, but it's just two different regions of the same sheet. Because really the way that these serous membranes are formed is, um, so if you imagine for just a second, let me draw you a bad picture of it. That in um, the ventral body cavity, let's just draw a cavity. So we're gonna draw any old body cavity, doesn't matter which one, okay? And then within the body cavity, we're gonna draw an organ. Um, and the organ has whatever the heck shape it has. And then we're gonna look at how the serous membrane actually wraps around the organ and 
the um, cavity itself. So with the serous membrane, now what we're going to do is we are going to take and draw the serous membrane, again, touching the surface of the organ, okay, and then folding, and then touching the body wall. I know I'm not drawing it touching, but I don't want the lines to be on top of one another. Okay, and then it's gonna fold back around with the same sheet and meet itself. So what you are going to have is you are going to have right here, this portion right here, that is coating the body wall. Um, that is going to be called the parietal, I-E-T-A-L, parietal portion. And then the portion that is actually touching the surface of the organ is the visceral portion. There needs to be a C in there. Hold on, let me correct my spelling. C-E-R-A-L, visceral, okay? But there is one little portion right here that is neither visceral nor parietal. Um, this part right here. So it's not on the body wall and it's not the organ itself. That has a special name. Um, it's neither visceral nor parietal. It tends to attach the organs to the body wall and sort of hold them in, in place. So that for instance, your liver doesn't really ever end up um, below your urinary bladder, okay? So what is that little portion called? That little portion is called this portion right here, draw a line from down here. That portion right there is called mesentery. So we have the visceral part, the parietal part, and then the mesentery, okay? So let's talk about how that correlates with naming the rest of them. Because this figure that we're looking at here has separate sheets. Like there's a sheet that wraps completely around the heart and the pericardial cavity. There's a sheet for the left lung. There's a sheet for the right lung. And then there's one big sheet that um, really wraps around um, all of the organs and the cavity um, in the abdominal pelvic region. So let's talk about that. So um, basically you are going to have different sheets. Um, so let's do the easy one first. The easy one is to look at how the heart actually works. So this picture right here is actually showing you sort of the metaphor that they use to describe how the heart usually works. And it's like this. So if you imagine you take your fist and you push it into a softly blown up balloon, what you're gonna do is you're gonna end up with balloon that's coating your hand and then a space and then another layer of balloon. Between the two layers, if it were a balloon, there would be air, but you're not a balloon, your heart's not sitting in a balloon. What's gonna be between the two layers is going to be fluid. It's a clear fluid called serous fluid and it's lubricating. And the lubrication ends up being really important because of course the heart is not still. So the heart basically fills with blood and then empties, mostly, and then fills with blood and then empties, and then fills with blood and then empties. And as it does that, the two serous membranes are actually going to rub against one another. If they rub against one another and they're dry, there's friction and friction leads to damage potentially. But if they rub against one another and they're moist, and lubricated, then um, there's less likelihood of damage. So these serous membranes are actually protecting the organ by lubricating and reducing friction. So let's talk about the names now. We already said visceral and parietal, but now let's look a little more closely and talk about which portions um, within the heart. So let's look at just the heart for just a second. Okay, so if I am actually looking at the heart specifically, and we're gonna draw the same thing, only we're gonna add a little bit more detail to it. So now what I'm doing is I'm drawing the parietal portion of the serous membrane, and then I'll fold around, and I'll draw the visceral portion of the serous membrane. But I can actually name this completely now because I know visceral and parietal, and I know which organ and cavity I'm talking about. So now let's actually name them specifically. So if I want to talk about this part right here, okay, now I can give it a specific name. I can call it the parietal, parietal, what? 
The um, layer that wraps around the heart is called the pericardium. Peri as in around, cardi as in heart, so it's the parietal pericardium. So what about this part right here? What about this part that's actually touching the heart itself? What's that layer called? That one is called the visceral, keep me visceral, pericardium. Okay, so in each of these situations, let me point something out to you, just as far as the terminology goes. You've got um, an adjective and then you've got a noun. The adjective here is parietal, meaning it's touching or forming the body wall. And then the noun is the pericardium because this whole sheet that I've drawn in red around the heart, that's all pericardium. So this one right here has an adjective, visceral, as in it's touching the surface of the heart, and a noun, pericardium, okay? So that is the heart, what's going on around the heart. So now let's talk about a different region. Let's talk about um, the lungs. What about the layers that are around the lungs? Let's talk about those. Okay, so around each lung, what we are going to have um, is each lung actually is in a separate cavity and has a separate serous membrane. That ends up being really, really important if, for instance, one of your lungs collapses because the other one is still potentially intact. So let's look at what the layers are around just a single lung, and then we'll talk about what you have to do because, of course, you have two of them. So the layers around a single lung. So let's talk about that. All right, so around a single lung, we basically got the same story going. So what we are going to have is we are going to have two layers. So let's start on the outside. Here's a layer that's going all the way around the body cavity, and then it's gonna fold in, and then it's going to wrap all the way around. This is the left lung, okay? So what do you call these things? Well, now we're gonna do an adjective and a noun again, and so what am I gonna call that one? I'm going to call that one um, visceral or parietal, guys. What do you think? Visceral or parietal? Well, it's written right here, but I'm gonna write it again. It is called the parietal, um, though only this time of course it's not going to be the pericardium because that's not what you call that sheet. You call it the pleura, P-L-E-U as in air. So the parietal pleura. And to be more specific, since I've got a pair of them, I'm going to have to say it's the left parietal pleura, okay? Um, what about this one? What about the one that's actually touching the surface of the lung itself and making the lung look really shiny? What is that one? That one is the visceral pleura. So in each instance, again, what I have is an adjective, visceral or parietal, and then the same noun. Okay, they're both pleura. Okay, and so these left visceral pleura, left parietal pleura on that one. Okay, and then the last one and the one that's actually the biggest membrane of all is this big one right here, this big sheet that's like wrapping around almost the entire abdominopelvic cavity. That one, the whole sheet is called peritoneum, peritoneum, okay? So let's look at what the peritoneum actually does. So we'll blow this up a little bit so that you guys can see what's happening. And we'll draw it. Okay, so you don't need me to draw the whole blasted thing, but let me just draw enough so that you can see what we're talking about here. So this sheet, one big sheet wrapping all the way around the cavity and then folding in and wrapping around almost all the organs in the cavity, folding down, back, till you get really tired of drawing it, okay? So this is a big, huge sheet um, of serous membrane. And so what is it gonna be called? So what it's gonna be called is, and we'll just use their colors now, 
So what am I going to call it right here? If it's um, not touching an organ, but it's actually um, forming or forming the body wall or, or um, uh, coating the body wall, what am I going to call that? Well, I'm going to call it parietal. Parietal what? The whole sheet is peritoneum. Again, adjective, noun, okay? What about the part of it that is like um, wrapping and making my, for instance, small intestine shiny? If I opened up my guts, what is that part called? That part is called visceral peritoneum. Adjective, noun. So it's all the same noun, it's all peritoneum, but you've got two different portions of it, okay? All right, so now um, you can also, in this picture, by the way, see a few little pieces that are not actually wrapping around an organ or the body wall, like this is a great one right there. That would be an example of mesentery, okay? Mesentery. All right, so the only other thing that I need to introduce to you guys about this is um, the term retroperitoneal and then the concept of the peritoneal cavity. Okay, so first, retroperitoneal. Retro means behind. So there are a few organs that are not wrapped in visceral peritoneum that are actually behind the peritoneum. So this is a little hard to grasp, um, but let's just look at an example. So can you guys see that on this figure, um, like the liver is wrapped in visceral peritoneum. Come on. So it's got visceral peritoneum wrapping all the way around it, right? All the way around with the liver, okay? So, and then the parietal peritoneum is behind it. But um, look at this organ right here. Look at this one. Do you see that that organ is actually behind the parietal peritoneum? That organ is actually what we call retroperitoneal, meaning that if the metaphor was like, okay, we're, we're um, going to describe the whole parietal, visceral and parietal peritoneum as like, I've got a Pyrex dish and I am going to wrap the Pyrex dish before I put anything in it, and we're gonna call that the parietal peritoneum, and then I'm gonna take the same sheet of saran wrap and wrap a sandwich and put it in the Pyrex dish. So um, there were two layers of saran wrap between the sandwich and the dish. Then the sandwich in this metaphor would be wrapped with visceral peritoneum and then the dish would be wrapped with parietal peritoneum. But what if there was a cookie in the dish before you wrapped it? It would be behind the peritoneum like this guy right here. So it would be, oops, sorry. It would be retroperitoneal. So um, retroperitoneal organs are between the parietal peritoneum and actually the cavity or body wall. Um, good examples, not shown in this picture because this is a kind of almost a mid-sagittal section. If it were truly mid-sagittal, it would have gone through his junk. But almost a mid-sagittal section, I think, is what it's trying to show you. But the kidneys are retroperitoneal. They're behind the peritoneum. Um, the pancreas is also retroperitoneal. There are a few other things that are retroperitoneal, which is this word right here. And then the last thing on this set of notes, um, before I talk just a little bit about diseases, is the concept of the peritoneal cavity. And so um, these areas, like the space between the visceral and the parietal peritoneum are really small. Um, and even the space between the visceral and the parietal pleura is really small. But look how much real estate there is here between the um, visceral and parietal peritoneum there's a decent amount of space in there. Such a decent amount of space that it got its own na name. And its own name um, is the peritoneal cavity. So here we have the peritoneal cavity right here. 
So the peritoneal cavity has shouldn't have any organs in it. What it really should just have in it is just serous fluid on a good day. But what if, for instance, you punctured your liver, or punctured your spleen, and you had bleeding into the peritoneal cavity? Um, that is often referred to as internal bleeding, and it's not going to make you any less dead than external bleeding. It's just bleeding into this cavity. So most of the time, there are, there are no organs in the peritoneal cavity. Now, if you damaged, for instance, the visceral peritoneum and then portion of the liver went through, then you would have some organs in your peritoneal cavity, but that's not generally the case. Um, so this is called the peritoneal cavity. So I want you to think about these terms to figure out the relationship between the abdominal pelvic cavity and the peritoneal cavity. Which one of these is true? A, the peritoneal cavity is contained within the abdominal pelvic cavity, or B, the abdominal pelvic cavity is contained within the peritoneal cavity. Which of those is true? One more time. A, the peritoneal cavity is contained within the abdominal pelvic cavity, or B, the abdominal pelvic cavity is contained within the peritoneal cavity, which is true. A is true, right? So um, the peritoneal cavity, the whole thing that contains all your organs um, down here is considered the um, abdominal pelvic cavity. And then within that is the organs and then the peritoneal cavity that's between your um, uh, visceral and parietal peritoneum, okay? Um, all right, so um, when I ask for examples, sometimes I don't give you all of them. You can look those up. Um, okay, so the last little tidbit is, what if these serous membranes go bad on you? What if they overproduce? What if they underproduce? Oh, well, of course, everything that could possibly go wrong with the human body will at some point in someone go, go wrong. So let's talk about a couple of situ uh, situations in which that occurs. Um, pleurisy is when the visceral or parietal pleura, the pleura around your lungs, um, starts to... Um, overproduce and then sometimes underproduce fluid. A lot of times it happens with chronic respiratory irritation. Pleurisy can be a complication later of smoking or working in a coal mine or something like that. And so if it starts to overproduce fluid, then the fluid, the pressure of the fluid kind of restricts the ability of your lungs to fill maximally. If it starts to underproduce fluid, then the visceral and the parietal pleura will um, rub against one another and create friction. And sometimes you can hear that when you're listening to the lungs with a stethoscope. Um, it's called pleurisy and it kind of sounds like as you inhale and exhale. Um, eventually, sometimes they will actually um, form an adhesion and the visceral and the parietal pleura will stick together. Um, so what if that happens around the heart? Well, if it happens around the heart, it's a big deal because you've only got one heart and it's really important for all of the organs for that the heart um, functions correctly. At least you got two lungs, you know. Um, so what is pericarditis? Pericarditis, itis implies inflammation. So it is actually an inflammation or an irritation of the pericardium. And what generally happens is you irritate it. Maybe you had open heart surgery. Maybe you had some kind of pathogen that infected it. And it will start to overproduce fluid. And as it overproduces fluid, the pressure, because of the extra fluid right here between the visceral and the parietal pleura right here, um, will push onto your heart, which will reduce its ability to fill maximally, which will, of course, compromise your, your heart's pumping capacity. Um, so it is potentially deadly. If you had open heart surgery, of course it's going to irritate your pericardium. But of course they're looking for that. And that's an inpatient procedure. So they will definitely be looking for that. You can drain off the extra fluid if you know it's occurring. But there are some other things in which they're not looking for it and it just actually occurs. It can be deadly. And then um, what about peritonitis? Peritonitis is irritation or inflammation of the peritoneum. And um, that also can occur with abdominal surgery. It can also occur as a complication after appendicitis, all kinds of things. Um, and the fluid will start to build, build up in the peritoneal cavity. Come, come, sometimes it will distend your abdomen, cause ascites. 
Okay, and that's it for today.